Hello everyone, um, welcome to uh, today's pre-post-lunch session, uh, Social Machines 6, I believe. Six sessions already. We have three exciting talks for you this afternoon, we'll be running for about an hour and a half before breaking at 4pm. Uh, please feel free to come and go as you wish, um, as always the hashtag is Wikimania2014 and first up we have Eric talking about new patterns in Wikisats. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, as you can see, I uh, changed the title of the presentation somewhat. It's not all about new patterns. In fact, maybe I'm going to talk more about some of the metrics that we are already communicating for many years. So, I work for the foundation as data analyst. So I have two topics. I'll first tell you more about the metrics that we uh, commonly share with the public and the press. And I would like to make a case of being a bit more humble and giving somewhat lower figures. I'll explain. And after that I talk about editor trends. I have some new charts for you. So here are a few of the most well-known core metrics that we put in our presentations, that we print in the leaflets and always tell to reporters in an interview. 32 million Wikipedia articles. We are the fifth website according to Comscore. And we have Wikipedias in 284 languages. I'm going to nuance all of, the, all of these a little bit. I would say that we are overdoing it by saying we have 32 million articles. Really many of those are proto-articles, or as we call it, stops. And the average reader may not notice. They have a picture in their mind of those long articles about well-known issues. And they think, oh, 32 million of those? Of course, many of those articles, those stops, have been created by bots. 
and there has been a lot of coverage in, in that area recently. The Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post gave a major article about it. I see good news for those uh, stops, but we might call them differently. So I thought a little bit about how could we get to a more fair assessment of how many articles are really viewed by the public. That would be an interesting metric. I looked at the monthly um, um, uh, composite file, which shows for all Wikipedias, for every title, how many views there would have been. And it gave me a number close to 15 million. So that's even higher than 32. And then I realized that many of those entries in our database um, are really pointing to the same articles. Um, they have spelling differences or encoding differences. And of course we have a huge number of redirects. So this is not going to help us on at, at the moment, but we will soon have better um, better infrastructure and then we might use this approach. Other than that, there's also the issue that at the moment we don't um, make any difference between real views by humans and requests by bots. I'm fairly confident that the first bar is with five to nine requests per month is totally bots only. Would that be also the case for the next bar and the bar after it? We don't really know. So we need to improve our data collection and we are working on it. Second reality check. We are the fifth website according to Comscore. Yet we are also the 27th website according to Comscore. In the first case we talk about unique visitors. So if, if a person only f makes one page view in a month, that person would count. In the second case, we talk about page views, and that's also a very common metric to compare sites. And in the second case, we are even down in 12 months time from 20th to 27th place. I listed all those three, 26 web properties that rank above us. I'm not saying that the second metric is better, but I thought it might be interesting to know that we can change perspective. Here's a list of issues with the Comscore data, which actually makes those data rather fuzzy. For one, we use only part of the com functionality that Comscore gives us because of our strict privacy policy. So if a person does look at the page, there's no signal directly to Comscore. They can only rely on their earlier approach being um, panel-based. People can sign up and tell some, uh, give some information about themselves, where they live, their age, and so on. And then Comscore translates one page view, stands for so many people. Another issue is that Comscore does not include people below age 15 for some reason. And for many websites that wouldn't make much difference, but of course for us it does. Then specifically about unique visitors, I assume that there are probably, probably rather many double counts because people use Wikipedia via different <coughs> devices using that desktop PC at home and at work, using a tablet and maybe a mobile phone both, using different browsers. Comscore tries to deduplicate, but that's not easy. It might not be complete. And for sure we know that lots of our mobile traffic is not in their stats. They have a different system and we don't subscribe to that. I should mention, by the way, that all the data we get from Comscore is graciously uh, given to us for free. And we're really glad about that. Then about page views, there are some issues there. For all those years that we used Comscore data, we counted three times as many as they do. Part of the reasons are higher up in the list. 
Um, but then again, as we yet don't uh, filter out crawl of traffic, maybe 20% of our numbers are for uh, search engines collecting our data. So there's a lot of fuzziness. It might be that in one metric we are not fifth, but six, and maybe in the other we are not 27, but 20 or 15, who knows? Unfortunately, we can't improve on that. So we have to find our own better methods. <coughs> Thirdly, and I feel rather strongly about this one, we've always presented the number of 800 wikis, and we have Wikipedias in 284 languages. I'm going to show you an animation that builds on that. It's been there for several years, I made some uh, extensions. What you're going to see, I'll first explain, is every circle stands for a Wikipedia language. They all start bottom left. The horizontal axis is the time scale, so it's the age of the wiki. And while they travel from left to right, you'll see them rise, because vertically is the article count in a logarithmic scale. Then the, the diameter of the circle uh, stands for the number of editors on that wiki. And the coloring says something about the article depth. So I'm going to run that animation. And as you'll see, it, it paints a kind of rosy picture. I'll explain that. First, here's in April 2001, only the English Wikipedia. Let me maximize the screen. Then you'll see more and more. Uh, I think this is better. You'll see more and more wikis uh, appear and grow in size over time. Many of the Wikipedias linger at the at near the, the bottom axis, but sooner or later they start to grow and it seems they're all happily going in one direction, top right. That's not really the case. If I color all those Wikipedias with no actors at all, no editors at all, that's a fair amount, all those yellow circles. If I also color those with less than five active editors per month, that's a bunch. So, I think we have an issue here. <coughs> I can click on any of these and show the history of that particular <coughs> Wikipedia. And as you can see for this week one, the Oromo language, it's yellow all over, no editors in that month. And in a few months there were a few editors active. I'll pick another one. Bislama, same story. So, this animation paints kind of a rosy picture. But that's only something that we, it, it, it's for, for so many years, it seemed everything was going fine and it would, was just a matter of time and all those Wikipedias would pick up speed, but some haven't. So, here are some counts. For those 284 Wikipedias, 12 are what I would call dead. They're locked. Nobody can edit. Particular reason being that there's nobody to fight spam, so they would degrade. But there's not much to degrade in many cases because <coughs> many of our Wikipedias really have only 10 articles. And then there's a larger um, volume of, I call them zombies. Um, they are open, they are alive, but nobody is doing anything. And then there's the middle section, where I would say we are struggling. There are less than five editors, but of course they are doing good work and hopefully they'll catch on. That leaves 125 in good or excellent health. And of course, my threshold is arbitrary. If I plot this over time, 
you see two lines here from the beginning in 2001 till now with the number of wikis that passed a threshold in red of at least one editor in blue uh, at least five you see that there's at least the, at least the trend is going upwards so that's 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 good but we have a long way to go in the blue line if not even 50 percent of the wikipedia's has is is above that struggling threshold i would say sorry uh, the, the, the usual definition being uh, a person doing five or more edits in a content namespace, which is mostly namespace here. So re real articles. In case you wonder, the, the strong uh, uh, fluctuation in early years is because in, at some moment we only had one Wikipedia, then we had two or three, but they were all active from the start. And then somebody said, well, couldn't we start uh, Wikipedia in, 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 in many other languages and people just uh, opened them up before there was a community. Nowadays we do that different. There's an incubator project. Here are those languages which have at least 10,000 articles and less than five active editors. And well, the top one is only one person who has to maintain those 220,000 articles. So I would hope that you can come up with a more balanced definition. I don't have any one ready, but here are some suggestions. We could say we have so and so many Wikipedias with at least 100,000 page views a month, and then page views being views by humans and not requests by bots. Or maybe we put a threshold and say uh, we only count them uh, when there's at least three active editors or a thousand articles created by humans. All of these can be widely discussed. I'm just proposing we open that discussion. So I, I, I would like us to err on the side of humbleness. And jokingly, I say, if a reporter tells us, can I ask you about 284 Wikipedias? We say, oh, you counted them, interesting. We knew it was above 100. <coughs> but then again, let's not overdo that. <coughs> because sometimes that happens. At last Wikimania, uh, Jimmy in his keynote speech told us about the 120 languages with at least 1,000 articles. Well, that was one zero to less. <laughs> we really have 120 Wikipedias with 10,000 articles and 220 with 1,000. The second one seems um, not that bad, really, but then I have to nuance a little bit again, because many Wikipedias start with one or two editors, and they find out one of the oldest bots we have is uh, how to create stubs for the 2,000 years after the birth of Christ. And those are all empty articles for a long time. Then again, I'm not debunking. I'm just proposing that we use more measured uh, metrics, and we will be still as awesome. That's <coughs> not going to change. But it might help us to prevent some reporters going deeper, diving deeper into those metrics and, and saying, hey, did you know that so many of your wikis only have 10 articles and they also had 10 articles five years ago? And then we have to say, yeah, we knew, we did, just didn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my second topic, as uh, a trend. This is a well-known chart plotting the number of active editors on the English, English Wikipedia and then uh, in yellow and the blue line uh, all Wikipedias together. It's a bit outdated really, I apologize for that. But you probably, most of you are probably familiar with it. What we did a few months ago was do a slightly different uh, breakdown. After we um, we 
collected uh, the duplicated uh, metrics, meaning every editor is counted only once, no matter on how many wikis they are active. We came to we came to this chart. The dark blue line, which is still going down, is for the English Wikipedia. That didn't change. But if you look at the light blue line, that's all Wikipedias except the ex English Wikipedia, it's fairly stable. So on average, all those other languages keep their ground. Then below the that the orange one is for all other projects combined. And they are on the rise. The peaks you see are the three peaks you see at the right are for Wiki Lost Monuments. So and a fair amount I would say of those people stayed on the project even when they only signed up during the contest. Maybe six or seven percent for the for the two years ago, a little bit less for last year might still come. So I was wondering, could it possibly be that part of the decline in the English Wikipedia could be explained by editors migrating from one language to another or from one project to another? I would assume that many people start with the English Wikipedia even if it's not their native language because it's the largest and most prominent, but they might later find out that there's also a good Wikipedia in their language and they might then hop over. So I tried to get some metrics for that. I'll first explain how I made it operational. So I have two thresholds. A person is only included if they have at least 25 edits in a certain year. I mean, if, if they have one or two hands full, there is, there is no um, <coughs> it, it's kind of noise, as they say in, in statistics. Um, there can't be, there, there's not a main project probably. So we, we look at people with a, a, a fair amount of edits. And then only if they have 60% or more on one project or one language, um, we count them in that would only leave out another one or two percent. I played with different thresholds, but the results are pretty much similar. So in this example, John starts on the Wikipedia project. In 2009, it, it's obviously his main project. And the same goes for 2010, so no migration there. Then in 2011, the threshold is not met of 25 edits, so we count that out. In 2012, the threshold is met, but there is no main project, really. Again, we don't include it. And then in 2013, he changes to Wikisource and finds that much more interesting. <coughs> so there we have a migration. And in 2013, 14, he changes his mind, and again, we have migration. So when I scanned for the, I scanned for the, uh, the duplicated editor accounts, I came up with figures like these. Sorry, it's a lot of figures. It's, um, and I uh, sorted them by uh, absolute number of migrations. So first column being from Wikipedia to Wiktionary. Um, second column from Wiktionary back to Wikipedia. And then third to Wikibooks, fourth to Wikisource, Wikidata, and so on. <coughs> this still doesn't tell us that much. These are absolute counts. If we <coughs> present it as percentage of overall editors, then it's more meaningful. And we can see that there's really not much migration going on in or out Wikipedia. It's less than half a percent in, in every year. Of course, it's a totally different story for Wikidata. There's a huge amount of migrations and they are all from other projects. And for the other uh, smaller sister projects, it's a fair amount. There are so many less editors that it adds up soon. But it doesn't explain the decrease in Wikipedia. Now, if we look, first this chart, I plotted here some of those metrics. And 
Well, the basic takeaway is that migrating in or out, the purple or blue line, are close to the x-axis. <laughs> yes, it, I could have left them out. What you've, the, the, the other lines are green for veteran editors who um, you're a veteran when you're still an, on the project in your second year. And then the, the new editors are broken down again into, uh, and that would be the highest of the red lines, into those um, who are uh, active for a longer time, they might become a veteran in due time, and then the people who just were passing by and did no more edits after two months. Interestingly, that last one is fairly stable. <coughs> Another table. This is the same idea, but here we look at the migration from one language, Wikipedia language, to another. And uh, instead of presenting the incoming and outgoing migration separately, I just present the, the net total. There's not much migration going on. Only in the f first few years it was, it was uh, noticeable when the projects were very small. Last. I don't think it's very useful to, to calculate those migrations every month. It was mm, interesting to see um, the overall picture, but that would be, <coughs> would be enough, I would say. But then I realized that I could use the same data and part of the same script to redo a, a, a mm, chart that we only produced once in 2010, which is our retention figures. So. The total amount of people who sign up in a certain month would always be 100%. And then in the next month, you, s you see how many s did edit again, and again in the months after. And um, of course, that the, the figures, those figures drop. But as the chart shows, um, they drop f uh, f fastest for the, for, the, for the new people who signed up in recent years. I'm going to show the same chart again, zooming in on those recent years from 2007 onwards. And only the last, uh, the, the, the bottom 20% is just zooming in. And you see there's still a decline in retention rates, but it's rather small compared to the decline in early years. I would say we shouldn't be discontent with this. So that's, to sum it up, we have uh, a little decline, but most of it is just on one wiki, <coughs> an important one, but nonetheless. <coughs> and the retention rates, like I just said, are uh, decreasing, but only a, f only a, a small bit. The, I would call it almost stable. And then, as I showed, the editor loyalty is really high. Most people start with a certain project and a certain language, and they stick to it. So that concludes my talk. Do we have time for questions? Well, yes, please. Uh, so to me, he kind of obvious, but I don't know if like, it's important to mention, but when all the other wiki is pretty on outside Wikipedia, outside Wikimedia, and on Wikia, or you know, on Wikidot, all of the topics specific with these, these are taken away a lot of the new contributors because they're about topics that are you know, more focused and you can write all, you know, all that you want and don't have to deal with the descriptions. Have you tried measuring that in any way? No, but it would be interesting to, to do that. Um, they have dumps, so we might uh, run the same scripts over, over those data and some, some at some time look at, uh, at those Migrations. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't repeat the question. So the question was, might it be that many um, uh, editors are leaving Wikimedia, but they w w uh, went to Wikia maybe because they like those topics better or the rules over there? We don't know, but it would be interesting to to look at, at it. Thank you. Someone else? Yes, please. Hi. You you showed us how how you model migration from one uh, 
which project to, to another. Uh, what, did you use the same criteria for migration between Wikipedia languages? Yes. Okay. In, uh, yes. I, I didn't mention that the chose the same thresholds. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the work. Really interesting. Just I guess maybe a, a caveat on this is one point. Who migrates away from Wikipedia the ladies? I guess migrating away is a primary language that they're going to be the, the primary thing they added most frequently. But do you have any stats on whether they brought in so, they, so even if they're even if they started English Wikipedia, they keep in English Wikipedia, but then they started editing additional uh, ones just less frequently than, than that. That could happen. So uh, a person could be 100% editing on the English Wikipedia and then partly sh shift to another language, but still be counted above 60% for the English Wikipedia. Yeah, that's that's. We could nuance these metrics even further, but I'm not sure if we are going to do that really soon because there's an overall overall takeaway, I would say. Yes, the significant difference between uh, 2013 and 2007, uh, say, was mostly uh, the editor retention. Uh, these are mostly about 10 to 20 months. Uh, what about the initial two, three months? How have they, uh, as statistics, changed? So what we see in this chart is uh, cohorts. I didn't mention. These are only the people who signed up in January. You could do the same chart for February and March and so on. But then we looked at all months, so you don't see maybe the the second months it might be above 50 percent, but to make the other ones the, the, the overall lines more visible, I chose to cut it off at 50 percent and blow up that part. Um, I don't think there's much information there to be gained really. Yes? When the graph, um, the, the Wikipedia grows, which is with age, it looks as though some of the Wikipedia's were reaching certain points and they're not growing anymore. That was um, <coughs> my, my main point, really, that so many Wikipedias are void of editors and I can, I can uh, let me let me show it in linear scale. Um, I'll show you the I'll show you the English Wikipedia months over months, and there's a fairly consistent growth in a number of articles. Hasn't really uh, slowed down, I would say. Sorry, I'm not sure I follow. Yeah, it's all down a bit, for sure. see, uh, but I'm not too pessimistic. I think we still have a decent growth in the large wikis. So, yes, please. Obviously, want more new new editors, and rather today than tomorrow, we have, we have an issue.
Of course. We have a lot of other charts and many of those break down to activity level. And there you can see uh, the number of uh, people who edit 100 times or more. And, um, but I couldn't put more, more of this in one chart. And, but I, I'm going to, to, uh, to blog about this and present some more charts. And so you can see. One more question, maybe? No, not yet. Good point. I'm going to add it. <laughs> yes, I think uh, you're right. Wikidata, like I showed in the migrations, uh, it's it's the second uh, project in number of migrations, whatever that tells us but in all kind of respects it's uh, usually growing and uh, it will more so thank you very much thank you eric do we have stephen here We have Stephen and Aaron talking about unmasking anonymous <coughs> editors on Wikipedia. Okay, so uh, the title was a little bit like uh, crazy, um, but just to start start off, we didn't actually like individually find any anonymous editors and like reveal their identity or anything like that. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, but you can you can go now if you really want. Um, <laughs> Um, instead, we're just going to talk about like boring data and stuff like that. So um, you can you can leave now if you want. Um, so uh, we are. I'm I'm Stephen Walling, uh, user Stephen Walling on English Wikipedia, and I'm a product manager at the Wikimedia Foundation. And this is Aaron. Um, he's a research scientist at the foundation. He's at Epic Fail on English Wikipedia, um, and we both work on a team called Growth. Um, and the purpose of our team is basically uh, the foundation is doing. Uh, these big software projects, Flow, Visual Editor, Mobile, um, that sort of are building, either building new platforms for contributing or um, reworking old ones. Um, but if we actually want to start growing the Active Editor community, 
then we need to figure out um, ways to tweak and, and use those tools to acquire more new people to get in the front of the door and, and try that stuff out. Um, so that's what we're working on. And we're gonna talk about two things today. We're gonna talk about, just generally speaking, the like volume and impact of anonymous editing on the project, um, mostly using English Wikipedia as an example, um, just because it's the largest. Um, and then also we're gonna talk about um, two A-B tests that we ran for new features that asked people, specifically anonymous editors, uh, to register and sort of uh, what the results of that were and where, where we're headed next. So just as a little bit of background, just in case you didn't know why we care about this problem, um, we measure the community as the group of people who every single month make five or more edits to the project. And over time, like you know, this is, you might have seen this before, we call this the like, oh shit graph because um, it shows that the, both the, the blue line is the total number of active editors on English Wikipedia and then the red line is the one year retention rate of new people who joined. So the chance that someone who joined on January 2014 will actually be on the project and that be an active editor on January 2015. And you can see that that just sort of like fell through the floor. And that this, this problem that we see across um, many large Wikipedias, English, German, many others, is that um, we get we have a, like, we get people in the door, they become Wikipedians, they become obsessed and addicted, um, and they st tend to stick around a long time, but now nowadays lots and lots of people join the project and then leave immediately without contributing at all or making a few edits and then running away. Um, so that's the, that's the problem we're trying to solve by bringing new people in to sort of like keep the ranks of the community like refreshed and, and lots of people in, in the project. Um, and so, how that relates to anonymous editing is I think there's probably two ways you could you could sort of like frame why we have anonymous editing, like why we would build features for these people, why why we allow it to happen. One is that sort of like anonymous editing is like the Diet Cola version of real editing. Like you can do, like on most wikis you can do most things, like except for on English Wikipedia you can't create articles, on all Wikipedias you can't like upload photos, but you can do the basics of contributing and anybody should be able to do that without actually stopping and registering an account. We don't need to know those things about you in order to let you edit. And I think that's a perfectly valid way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that um, anonymous editing is sort of like the stepping stone to um, becoming a real Wikipedian and that by letting some people sort of like kick the tires and try out editing without any friction, um, we're making it more likely that they get hooked and be like, okay, this is a site that I want to join. I want to be with these people. I want to do this again and again and again. Um, and some of the data that we have suggests that this is true. When we ran an editor survey in 2011, 60% of Wikipedians who responded said that um, they, they recalled editing anonymously before they registered. That data is kind of unreliable just because you're asking people to remember the things they did years before they went editing, but at least suggests that people view anonymous editing that way. So, in order to basically figure this stuff out, we wanted to do start the project before we even tested some stuff by doing some background research into just like the overall nature of anonymous editing. Turns out we don't actually know that much about um, anonymous editors. Um, we didn't really measure the number of unique editors or even attempt to. Um, we have done very little qualitative studies into why people edit anonymously, though I think we have some pretty good hunches. Um, and we didn't, didn't do any more, other than the survey, we hadn't done any like more data-driven look at how many people start as edit editing anonymous, they go on to register and then become successful Wikipedians. So we spent a little time answering these questions. Um, so for the first one, just how many anonymous editors are there? Of course, um, over time, we don't actually track individual people or devices um, on all the Wikipedias. Um, so we wanted, to, if we wanted to take a look at this historically, we just needed to count unique IP addresses. So do you wanna, do you wanna talk about this a little bit? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. So. When I was trying to quantify anonymous editors, so I mean, there's a there's a relatively simple methodology to it, which comes with a bunch of caveats. Um, so uh, what these lines are showing is the raw number of users that I saw making an edit in the calendar month. Um, I counted anonymous editors as uh, a unique IP address, um, which is problematic because if you're editing from a cell phone and you connect to a cell tower, you're probably sharing the same IP address with everybody else connected to that cell tower. It's also a problem too, in that you could be one person in one house uh, editing Wikipedia over the course of a month and resetting your modem and getting a new IP address every day, every other day, every week. And we're not really sure how much these things affect the data. We've never, we've never tracked users beyond their actual IP address before. Um, but when we look at it this way, not really sure that we understand the caveats, we, we can still probably get a sense for what the scales probably look like. 
And what was really surprising to us is that there's dramatically more IP addresses editing Wikipedia, potentially anonymous editors editing Wikipedia, than there are registered users. It, note that this is just for the English Wikipedia. Yeah. So um, the, 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 state of, the state of the world today was that, um, and the, the user line here actually includes bots too, so it actually overestimates by, by a tad though discounting individual accounts. Yeah, um, but, yes? Yeah, no, actually, that's I probably should have started with that. Um, one of, yeah, yeah. So um, Toby wanted me to point out that um, so when we went back to this uh, this count of active editors, we don't include anonymous editors at all. When we look at the top line metrics every single month, um, and as a foundation, say like how are the Wikipedia's and other projects doing, we really don't even look at like how much anonymous editors are contributing. Like it's not, it's just like not on our radar right now. Um, so that was the one of the other reasons that we wanted to do this. Um, and that, I think that's this is interesting in that in that light that when you look at the, the difference between these two things, if, you're, if our measurement of the community is counting individual people and we're throwing out this huge group of potential individuals who contribute every month, um, then we're actually underestimating the size of the community in, in some ways. Um, and then the other look at this is how much do anonymous users, unique IP addresses actually contribute? Um, so the first one is unique IPs and then user accounts and then this one is um, total revisions. Um, so you can see this really dramatic flipping where um, there's lots and lots of anons in terms of unique IPs, but um, registered users contribute a lot more revisions. Um, and you see the same kind of trend when you look at bytes added. So in the past, some, some folks have done analysis that, that suggested um, out of a small sample of, of article edits, um, they tried to an analyze like the bytes contributed is to get a measure of who's who's actually adding content to the site and as opposed to just making edits. Um, and this, in, in terms of a measurement of megabytes, again, shows that um, we can, you know registered users are contributing a lot more than, than anonymous users are in terms of the total like byte content. Um, and then one other look at this is just how many, how, how long do registered users or anonymous editors um, contribute, like how many how many revisions per an editing session. So we count an editing session as, I'm probably going to screw this up, so Aaron should tell us about how so, Oh well, I wish I had my pretty graph for this, but yeah, yeah. but we actually, we did some modeling work to try and figure out what, what the expected amount of time between edits were when an editor was editing as opposed to when they were between edit sessions. And what we found is that there's actually some really nice clustering that we, we can do for time between edits within an edit session, time between edits between edit sessions. And something that actually surprised us, I didn't see this to, uh, expect this to come out in data, but we can actually see wiki breaks. Wiki breaks are a cluster that's between six uh, and 12 months. Um, but anyway, so using this model, we can actually do a pretty good job of figuring out when a, an editor is consistently sitting at the computer doing work on Wikipedia, and when they're sort of in between that, and using that strategy, we can make pretty good estimates about how many hours they're spending in a month actually editing Wikipedia, and that's what this graph is showing. It's, it's showing the total amount of time spent editing. So, and you can basically see that the, the, the mean revisions, per, like edits per editing session is about two for anonymous editors, and for, and it's a six for registered users. So if you think of anonymous editors as the kind of person who comes along to the site, sees an error, fixes it, maybe fixes a typo or their markup mistake afterwards, and then leaves the site um, for, that, for that, that time, that's a kind of accurate way of, of looking at it according to this picture. So, and then in addition to just looking at like how much do people contribute, how many unique IPs are there, we wanted to say, um, how many people start out in, in, a single, in a single period at your computer, like I'm, I'm bored at work or I'm in class or I'm watching a TV show or something, and I decide to fix something in Wikipedia, and then afterwards I go and I register, and then I keep editing and become a Wikipedia. How many people are like that versus how many people show up to the site, find something interesting, and think, oh, I better register first before I start editing. Um, so we measured um, two groups of people. One, which is a group of people who had what we call a pre-registration edit session, who sat down and made at least um, a few edits before they registered. And then another group of people who did not have such a pre-registration edit session. And we measured the productivity difference in those two groups of people. Um, and basically what we found, and this is the mean number of article revisions 
Um, and basically on the, on the right here is the, the group of people who had a free registration edit session and the left is the group of new users who did not. And basically what this tells us is that um, people who had a pre-registration edit, edit session were significantly more likely to continue editing afterwards. And um, if you measure the amount of edits they made, they made basically double the amount of edits, even if you throw out the edits they made when they were anonymous before. So this is something that helped, helped suggest to us that this stepping stone theory might be true. Um, and then this is another look at it. This is just the proportion of, rather than saying the, the mean number of article revisions, this is the proportion of accounts out of each of those two groups that had um, edits that were not reverted. Um, so you see um, slightly more than 50, 57% of people um, in the pre-registration group uh, actually did have an edit that was productive and then less than that in the um, pre pre no pre-registration group. So we came away basically with three key conclusions out of this out of this background research. One, there's a really big group of people who are potentially editing every month. It's 350,000, and if you compare that to the group of um, total active editors across all Wikimedia projects, about 70, 80,000, um, this is a lot. This is a really big pool of people to potentially like either measure and include in our metric of total active editors, or convert to registered Wikipedians and get them to come back to the site again and again and that the people who are anonymously editing now are doing it in a much more casual way. They're coming by, they're fixing a few things, and then they're, they're leaving. Um, and that of the people who naturally already make those anonymous edits and then choose to go on and register, those people are much more likely to become productive Wikipedians who stick around and make the hundreds of thousands of edits a month. So our follow-up design questions to this were like what, what we came away with was, can, can we just ask people to sign up? Like we've never really done that before. There's these tiny sign up links to create account and, and um, log in in the top right. Um, and there's a few other little things, but there's no really big prominent call to action on the site to sign up. And then also at what point in the, the editor's experience is it a good idea to do that? So you have basically three potential times when you can ask somebody who's an anonymous editor to sign up. You can do it before they edit, so they, they've clicked edit or they're about to and you ask them to sign up, we call that like pre-edit. Um, you could do it while they're in the middle of the editing screen um, and say, hey, hold on, you're about to make an edit, but you're not logged in, your IP address is gonna be exposed. Um, and that's, that's there's actually a message for that on most of the edit forms for most Wikipedias, it's built into Media Wiki. And then we could ask them afterwards. We could say, hey, you just made an edit, thanks for doing that. Would you like to join Wikipedia and sign up and have an account? In the future, you'll be able to do X, Y, and Z with that account, yada, yada, yada. So in order to answer that question, it was experiment time, and we ran a couple A-B tests. Um, the control experience that all, all editors get um, is this message that you can see here on the edit screen that says you're not logged in, your IP address will be publicly visible if you make any edits, and it has little um, sign up calls to action within that. Um, interestingly, we actually uh, measured the amount of people who clicked that little create account link. Um, and then went on to uh, register. And on English Wikipedia, for instance, that, com that one link to create account on the edit screen com composed like 10% of all registrations on the site, um, which is really big. So it's another hint to us that like, hey, maybe these anonymous editors are people we should be asking to sign up. Um, so our first A-B test, um, we ran it on English, German, French, and Italian Wikipedia simultaneously for a week, and we tested two completely different workflows. So we tested asking people before they, they uh, got to the edit screen to sign up and we just tested asking people after they got to the edit screen to sign up. This was pretty fun because um, we, we actually took, usually we just run start run tests on English Wikipedia, A-B tested a little bit and then translated and rolled it out across Wikis and this was the first time that we ran simultaneous tests across all these languages um, which we were able to do solely because um, just by waiting an extra week before we started running the test, that gave all the translators on Translate Wiki time to catch up and, and translate the little bits of interface we were making. So big thank you to anybody here in, in the audience or who watches the talk who translates stuff on Translate Wiki because you, you're the people who enable us to like test things in multiple languages. Um, so the pre-edit workflow, and I put it in German just to amuse myself, um, uh, look basically like this. So what happens is the user clicks at it either at the section, the section edit link next to a, a, a subsection or at the page level. And then what happens instead of normally just taking the user to the edit screen, what happens is we um, show this user this little guided tour that says 
um, sign up and edit Wikipedia. Basically, um, we don't keep any personal information about you. It's optional, but we recommend that you sign up. And then the big blue button basically just takes you to the sign up page and then afterwards you get sent back to the, the edit screen. Um, and then there was like a no thank you link. So we tested this version independently compared to no, no, no intervention at all versus asking people afterwards. So what would happen is I'm anonymous, I go in, I make my edit, there's no interruption, and then after I make my edit, when I'm on the article again, I get this pop-up that points to the create account link and says join Wikipedia and gives you a list of the features that you would get um, if you want to um, like get an account. Basically it says that you can track your contributions, you can meet other Wikipedians, stuff like that. Um, and then that blue button also goes to create an account. So we're testing before people um, actually get to the edit screen and afterwards. So we wanted to test these two things. One, just because we prefer to like work with data rather than just assume one of them is gonna work and then test, but also because there's kind of like a, a rational theory that either of these might work. So, you know, um, in the pre-edit one, it kind of makes sense because even though it's slightly more annoying and interrupted because if you recommend that I sign up, it kind of makes sense for me to go ahead and do that before I go and make my edit. Otherwise, why would you, why, like, why would you recommend it um, if I'm supposed to not do that or if I can wait? Um, and in this one, the theory is we're not interrupting people and these are people who've actually completed an edit rather than just gotten to the, click the edit button. Um, so they're much more likely to actually be like skilled potential Wikipedians and we have a little bit more room now because we're not interrupting them to explain the benefits of an account. Um, so that's kind of some of the theory behind this. So what, what were the results? So basically um, from left is German Wikipedia, English Wikipedia, French Wikipedia, and Italian. Um, and this is the um, proportion of people who were anonymous and clicked at it who ended up signing up in each of these three buckets. Um, and the left-hand one is, is uh, control. The second one is the post-edit version where we ask people after, and the third one is the pre-edit. And basically what you can see here is that the pre-edit version was astronomically more successful at increasing registrations. On all of, on English Wikipedia, we um, increased registrations for that week by more than 100%. Um, and in, in uh, French and Italian, we actually increased it by like 200%. Question? Did you track how many people uh, registered before and then did you not make the edit? registered, what do you mean before? Before uh, we showed them the UI or? If you uh, offer the registration before the edit, mm -hmm. and then they completed the registration, did you check whether they completed the edit? Yes, so th this just matches registration, but we, we separately also measure actual like um, edit rates, um, which I'm gonna get to. Um, so this, 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 and this is this look at this data. So this is just the group of people who registered in each of these three buckets and um, how many of them actually reached active editor status so they made five article edits. This is just the English results as an example. Um, and basically what it tells us is that um, we, get a lot, we get a lot more people in the pre-edit version seeing the UI and clicking through to register. So we, we got close to basically four or 500 um, active editors uh, for, that, for that week. So we basically doubled active editors on English Wikipedia of new people for the week. And then the post-edit version, it's a smaller number of people who saw the UI and who actually clicked through, but the, the people who actually did that are significantly more likely to reach active editor status. It was five, five, almost five and a half percent versus um, just five. Um, so, but this is just the registered people. Um, if you remember, especially in the pre-edit version, we're interrupting people before they, before they get to the edit screen. Um, so we actually wanna look at the total productivity of the whole group, regardless of whether people registered or not, to know whether interrupting people caused some decrease in edits. So basically what happened, and, that, and that's actually what happened, we caused a really big increase in registrations. The people who registered were much more likely to be active Wikipedians, but the people who didn't register, especially in the pre-edit condition where we're interrupting people, um, were much less likely to actually like accept that call to action and sign up, and that people who didn't um, they didn't. They didn't edit. Only about six percent of the people who rejected the thing um, went on to actually make an edit. So we're we're causing a really big decrease um, in the total number of anonymous edits, basically by interrupting people and doing that, even though we gain a small number of active registered editors. Um, and then you. This is just another look at the same data. This is just the proportion of completed edits in each of the buckets for those things. So you see this this really obvious difference here. Um, and this is pretty much as we expected, um, though the effect, the negative effect on anonymous editors was, well actually in both directions, was quite a bit larger than I think um, 
we, we, we thought would happen. Um, so we, we came to a turning point where basically um, we, can, we can do two things. We can say, screw it, um, total active editors and our measurement of the community, this one metric that we, we optimize for, um, doesn't say anything about anonymous editors. So if we discourage anonymous editors from contributing, um, it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, so we can just sort of like go ahead with increasing the, the size of the community. Or we could say, we're increasing the size of the community in order to grow the encyclopedia. So if we're shooting ourselves in the foot along the way, um, that's not really helping us, even though we really want people to register and continue to be Wikipedians because those people are like the heart and soul of the project and they're the people who fight vandalism and become admins and make policy and like do a, a lot of the like higher level, more complicated things. Um, and so we, what we wanted to do is run a second test to see if this pre-edit version, we can still get a lot of people to register, um, but also not cause a big decrease in the anonymous editing activity. Um, so we just ran this version on English Wikipedia to run a, run a quick one, one week test. And we ran two versions. On the left is the, the English version of the pre-edit that you saw before. The user clicks edit and they get this thing that says sign up to edit Wikipedia. And then their main call to action is sign up or edit and no thanks. So the theory here is that we potentially cause that decrease in edits because we're really strongly suggesting that you need to sign up. And it's not obvious unless you already know that you could just click edit again or click no thanks and it will continue to take you to edit. Like it's, it might be that people um, thought that editing with registering was required. So on the right hand side, we tested a, a different version against this that said sign up or continue editing and had a really clear continue editing action. And so basically what happened is that um, we again saw an increase in the registration rate, though it wasn't as big as before, um, in part because we probably caught this large group of people who'd never been asked to um, register before. Um, and then we burned through a bunch of those people and they registered and um, then we caught a smaller group of people. So we still saw some of the positive effect for both of these versions, though smaller. And then we improved on, in terms of like not discouraging anonymous editors in the, the pre-edit V2, the version where you could say sign up or continue editing, lots more people actually did continue editing, but it was still a pretty statistically significant um, decrease in total anonymous edits. And this is where we're at now. So what's next is, is basically, um, we kind of have two options, and, I, I, and it, I'm not sure if we have enough time for total questions, but I'd also like to discuss this with people afterwards because I'd like to get some community feedback. But basically the foundation kind of has two big options. One is to say, um, we were not able to ask people to register and sign up um, without annoying enough people that they, they don't <laughs> contribute, and we don't want to do that. So instead, we should just change the way that we measure the community in order to say anonymous editors are editors too, um, maybe try and do something to figure out how many actual individuals there are as opposed to unique IPs, and sort of include it in the measurement of what the community is. And the other option is to say, we care more about registered Wikipedians than we do about anonymous editors, and we're willing to sacrifice some short-term productivity and edits for the promise of the future that someone might become a really active editor. Um, so we're gonna actually gonna test one more version where we actually offer to let people sign up or log in and give them the, the form to do so right on the, the edit screen after they get um, they, they click edit so that we're not interrupting people as much, um, one more version. But um, ultimately we need to have a, also a bigger conversation about what our metrics are, are they the right metrics, um, and, and uh, is this the right method for asking people to edit? So questions. I see Crinkle, I think. Um, I was curious about the group that uh, just presented the post-edit uh, registration um, uh, question. Yeah. Whether they also had the default behavior of the yellow notice on the edit page. So yeah, both, all three groups still had the default behavior of the notice on the edit page. And did you put that in the uh, statistic where those included as yeah, the, those result? people are included because it's a it's a cohort level analysis. It's not just the people who clicked on the thing. It's the people who got the I, one of the three UIs separately um, and then went through. So it's possible that somebody, for instance, um, regist registered. Well, actually, no, that's actually not possible. If you registered just by the create account thing, then you wouldn't have gotten the post edit notifications. You had to have seen it. Um, but yeah, basically. Um, Thank you for your work, it was really interesting. And I was I wanted to ask, your control group was uh, the default edit behavior, right? Yes. I was wondering if you have made some tests on how this origin is uh, signing up per se. Like, uh, maybe I have to fill, uh, fulfill out the Kafka and I don't want to do that because it's a waste of time. And maybe it's the login screen that is 
causing the fact that you are using before. So I was wondering if you may want to design some other control, which is just the, the sign-up process. How many people you are you losing in the sign-up process? So maybe the decrease you see is not that bad, or maybe the, the problem is. In, in the sign up, right? I don't know if I yeah, I mean, all, all three groups of people saw the same sign up form. So, in theory, the test controls for the negative effect of sign up. We know that we only get about 30% of people who get, of, of the people who get to the sign up page, not in this test, but in previous AB tests we've ran, only 30% of the people who get to sign up actually finish creating an account. We improved that a little bit when we did the sign up and login redesigns not that long ago. Um, but it should be accounted for in the design if I, test. If I might address that, when we, when we run experiments like this, oh, right, there we go. When we run experiments like this, we're really testing two versions of the world, not just an interface. And so you have to account for all the other things that happen in MediaWiki at the same time. So we're not just testing, showing somebody a CTA, but what they will do after seeing that CTA. So part of one of the hypotheses that I was working with when I was designing this experiment was that just being on the sign-up page alone, regardless of whether it demotivates you, it's gonna take some time. And so it reduced the amount of edits that you do. So we didn't just take measures of the amount of edits that people did, and we actually filtered out reverted edits to articles and that sort of stuff to make sure that we weren't just seeing low quality edits or something like that. But we looked at the proportion of people who even saved one edit to an article that wasn't reverted after signing up, and we saw the exact same decrease. So at the very least, there was no evidence that, that this time of going to sign up was actually having an effect. The condition was, was the biggest part of the effect in itself. Megan? Uh, do you know, were you able to measure uh, if it was their very first time clicking edit or like their second or their third whenever they got the, the sign up? Yeah, so the, the, there was actually a bug in the piece of software where uh, for a very small proportion of users, they would see that call to action over and over again as they were working and saving edits. Um, they, they were such a small proportion in the data set that it couldn't have had the, the effect that we saw. I mean, it, it may have had a small part in the effect, but we did specifically measure that to see how, how big that was, to see if it was confounding our data. When we ran the experiment the second time and still saw those productivity falls, we had that bug fixed and nobody saw the CTA. There were, there were, I think it was 0.001% saw the CTA more than once and they probably just reset their cache in their browser and blew away the thing. That's the only way we can tell not to show it to them again. We so, did. But I mean, we, less than just showing to them over and over again, I'm wondering if it's better like to let them edit maybe anonymously once or twice or three times and then give them. And then give them the thing. <laughs> yeah. just, mm, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, active, like, uh, we, so this they, is what this is. Yeah. The, the activation rate for users who, uh, regardless of interface, was exactly the same. Um, so there was a in statistically insignificant difference despite the high number of observations. And so you, you can sort of interpret that, not statistically, but practically, as there was no change in the rate of activations. But we did get a lot more people to sign up and register accounts. So you can basically think of that increase in registrations as increase in active users. But you know, of yeah. course, you still have to think about this decrease in the actual total number of productive edits. Yes. So when I, when I talk about the productivity decreases, I don't care whether they registered or not. Yeah. I just care whether they saw the interface. And I'll track them if they register and track them if they didn't register and use that in my calculations of productivity. I was wondering if we can do a quick hand raise of how many anonymous editors there are in this room. <laughs> and what their Three. names are. <laughs> or if people were anonymous and at which point they made an account, like yeah. how long after? So somebody just asked the question, how many people edited anonymously before registering their accounts? And how many edits did it take you until yeah. you made an account? Five edits. <laughs> Everybody hear that? How many edits did it take you before you uh, registered your account? Let's say zero to five. Uh, five to 20. 20 to 100. 100 to 1,000. All right, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Oh, one, one more question.
on uh, it's a bunch. So the UI part of it, the, the UI part of it is an extension called Getting Started um, that has a bunch of other garbage that we test stuff with in it. Um, and then the, the data portion is an extension called Event Locking. Designing targeted contribution campaigns. Foundation, and today I'd like to talk about uh, um, what I like to call uh, target acquisition campaigns. Uh, so the fundamental question that this talk is trying to address is uh, how can we use gaps and uh, quality issues in Wikipedia, or how can we use holes in the self human knowledge to basically create opportunities for new contributors to join the project, uh, uh, in particular subject matter experts, so those people who know a lot about a very narrowly scoped topics and that uh, we might be fighting uh, and struggling to attract with media. And so the the answer that I'd like to uh, propose is what I initially thought I would call AdSense for Wikipedia, but then someone told me it would be that good an idea. So I thought I would call this instead uh, targeted acquisition or targeted contribution campaigns. And, and so in this talk, I'll try and give you a sense of uh, the rationale for this, and I'll try a long way to debunk a couple of misconceptions that we have about uh, campaigns. Um, and then I'll turn to a proposal, uh, give you a sense of some applications, including a working proof concept that uh, um, uh, came to light uh, right after the, uh, uh, the conference, um, and discuss some of the infrastructure that we have, on some of the infrastructure that we may design in order to be able to support uh, uh, these campaigns. So uh, just a quick question, how many of you have heard of uh, Wikilabs Monuments? How many of you are involved in Wikilabs Monuments? How many of you run Wikilabs something campaigns? Okay, fantastic. That, that's an interesting audience I, I, I want to have here today. Um, so um, first, uh, first big myth or big um, misconception I want to debunk. Um, I often hear that campaigns such as Weekly of Monuments are not working, they don't scale. Um, and I want to remind everybody that Weekly of Monuments uh, has been the single most effective actor engagement campaign ever. Whether designed by the community of the foundation, <laughs> that is historically from the angle of active editors, which is one of many possible angles, but that's really the uh, uh, the initiatives that drove, uh, although for a short amount of time, uh, the largest amount of contributor, or new contributors, including new contributors uh, uh, in, in our projects. Um, and every year, as you can see, uh, these spikes represent uh, the rate at which uh, Wikilabs Monuments brings in uh, 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 active contributors, so people passing the uh, uh, famous uh, five contribution thresholds that, um, that Eric was referring to. And we know these campaigns are short-lived, we know that without sustained engagement, uh, uh, we, we will fail to retain uh, the majority of these contributors. However, as a movement, we've never really experimented uh, with a generalization uh, of this model that we could apply to any topic, or uh, we could run on an ongoing basis and not just uh, uh, once a year or a couple of times a year. So in fact, as most of you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, wiki love something uh, contains that are currently thriving. Um, but I would say that they're mostly deployed with no dedicated uh, technology, like a general purpose technology we could use to support them, um, or general purpose analytic support. Um, and by, by this I mean that uh, in general, these campaigns are costly to organize and to launch uh, programmatically at a push of a button. Um, but second, lacking analytic technology, they also, we, we don't have a, gener a generic infrastructure to measure uh, their impact. And I know there's a ton of community-driven effort that goes into collecting data, 
But it's, it's really hard to say, okay, today I want to run a campaign, uh, how do you collect data and how I measure its impact? Um, so um, the first question that to me comes from, from this is, uh, uh, if campaigns work, how do we make them cheap to run programmatically? Um, and how do we make their impact uh, easily measurable uh, on an ongoing basis? Um, Second misconception that I, uh, I'd like to call out uh, is the fact that Wikipedia is often perceived as virtually complete, uh, that there's no more work to do, and uh, you know it's basically something you can consume, it's really hard to contribute to it because it's mostly done. Um, and in fact, even if you look at just the most accomplished project we have, so the uh, English Wikipedia, which by size is the most accomplished one, um, you will see there's a gigantic backlog of work that needs to be done uh, in terms of stops, uh, and that doesn't even include like a, you know, um, low quality uh, article, just, just stops. Um, or articles that are marked for some quality issues, and uh, we know that this 20k figure vastly underestimates uh, the actual uh, number of articles that may need some, some kind of uh, um, uh, quality improvement. Uh, not to mention the uh, the, the hundreds of uh, articles that are missing, but then we know that people are looking for uh, on a daily basis. So this, uh, this is a figure for people who saw uh, rattling, uh, articles that are rattling, so they're missing the link from somewhere with at least 1,000 uh, page views uh, every week. It's massive. And we're not really doing a great job at surfacing uh, these issues and making them, again, programmatically accessible, uh, not just on Wikipedia, maybe even outside of it. How can we turn all of these hooks uh, and, and make them programmatically uh, uh, accessible as uh, potential hooks for uh, collaboration and new contributions? And so uh, I don't know if you know uh, the amazing work of uh, this guy based in San Francisco, Eric Fisher. He's a digital mapper and for years he's been documenting typos uh, in public signs. Um, and what I like about this project, he, he's awesome, he's a stellar, he's a digital mapper and he also documents uh, all of these uh, uh, quirky little things about San Francisco. And basically says that what motivates him uh, about uh, this project is the fact that these typos make it visible, uh, the uh, human fabric of the city. And I really like this, uh, this approach and I'm thinking that when we, when we look at Wikipedia and we tend to think of typos and quality issues as a problem, then we're kind of losing this perspective that uh, a cleanup template and a red link, they're considered like a nice sword for the reader, we should remove them, uh, we should really try and, and not to show that there are quality issues. Um, but these quality issues are really an open door for new contributors. Um, so and they reveal the fact that the project uh, is uh, under construction, it's constantly looking for contributors. So. Um, in other words, a typo, a missing section, uh, an article that lacks citations, a red link, are all opportunities for engaging new and existing contributors. So the second question here is, uh, uh, if there's this huge backlog of work uh, to do, how do we make it visible? How do we turn it into something that can be programmatically accessed? Um, and finally, so um, a third misconception that I'd like to debunk is that there's this continuous inflow of new contributors to our projects and users who sign up on our site. Uh, uh, so we shouldn't really spend uh, any effort into uh, programmatic outreach um, towards uh, potential new contributors. And I think that both of the foundation and the community, often we consider people who are not registered or people who are not visiting Wikipedia, so like second class citizens. Um, Stephen and, and Aaron presented basically this uh, meet of the anonymous contributor. Um, so I like to say in general, we have this uh, tacit model of uh, acquire first and activate later. So wait for someone to sign up. Once they sign up and start doing something, at that point they might become legitimate uh, members of the community. Um, now, what if we could reverse that perspective and think of uh, this notion of uh, direct activation? So activate immediately people who are not even registered on our site, or maybe who are not even visiting our site. So we know that there are massive expert communities out there that uh, are generating content as part of public communities, and they're not part of what we the projects, even though their mission and their vision is totally aligned with what we're doing. Um, so how do we reach out to these people before they even sign up, uh, other than with the simple cleanup templates that we have on our projects? 
And the reason why I think that uh, subject matter experts, uh, uh, non registered users, are really critical, uh, I think it's pretty well illustrated by this plot. So I want to spend a few seconds describing what, what this shows. So this is a plot that shows the um, new editor activation uh, of uh, newly registered users as a function of where they come from. So the, uh, the red point here tells you that about 25% uh, of uh, all newly registered users within 30 days complete their first, uh, their first edit. And this number, this is for image Wikipedia only, but we know this number has been fairly stable over a long amount of time. Now, if you're just knowing how this breaks down, uh, you have basically these two big buckets. One is a green bucket, and the other one is a blue bucket uh, that you see over there. So the green bucket represents 70% of all new registrations. And these are people who come in from a generic um, um, internal referral, like for example, the main page, um, no referral, uh, search, um, help pages about how to create an account. So there's this massive number of people who come in and actually pull this number uh, down, right? So 70% of these users are responsible for the fact that this number is not higher. And then you look at where this effect is coming from and uh, you see it, what the other folks are doing and that's a blue dot over there. Over there. And not only is it significantly higher, but it's like substantially higher than all of these folks and that bucket represents 30% of our registration in English Wikipedia. So what this tells us is that uh, the long tail of people who come in and edit specific articles are those who drive the, the activation number up. It's not the 70% of people who come in from generic, uh, uh, generic referrals. And one nice anecdote that I, I'm sure many of you know is that uh, the number one internal referral um, of, other than these generic uh, pages is uh, um, articles like Facebook or Google because people come in and they think that uh, they will find uh, the uh, Facebook sign up form and instead they land on, on Wikipedia. So even in that bucket, there's some weirdness going on. But um, uh, the point here is that uh, we should really look at people coming for very specific reasons who want to edit Wikipedia for very specific reasons. Um, so the question is, uh, how do we programmatically reach out uh, to this long tail of subject matter experts uh, who are more likely to become highly engaged new contributors? So we have these three outstanding questions, right? And uh, you'll notice I highlighted the, uh, uh, the word programmatically, um, specifically to call out the fact that uh, uh, all of this is happening at a low scale in a non-programmatic way, but I think there's a big opportunity to turn this into uh, new technology we could use to support uh, uh, these um, initiatives. And this is where I introduce uh, AdSense, uh, uh, target acquisition campaigns uh, for Wikipedia. Um, and I'm going to go quickly through uh, the, the model that I'd like to propose uh, and a few potential applications of this, of this model. So first off, um, imagine if content publishers like news sites, blogs, or content aggregators uh, could donate the attention um, to uh, union projects uh, of their expert readership. So there's a ton of uh, communities out there of people who know or are subject to uh, uh, subject matter experts uh, about uh, any topic you can name, uh, and then they might be willing to donate some of their time if they knew that there's something on Wikipedia that requires their help. Um, so imagine the ability of generating feeds of topics that need attention, that need quality improvement, that need expansion, and we could pitch them to the right audience uh, using these wiki ads uh, or gadgets. Calls to action you can embed uh, in a third party site. And similarly, so imagine if we could generate programmatically, if we could broadcast uh, in real time all sort of articles that we would love uh, to the most relevant audience via social media, for example. This is actually uh, a real proof of concept that was put together in record time before Wikimania, um, thanks to uh, the user Theopolis and Theopol, who is a maintainer of uh, the WP 1.0 bot, and we work together on putting together this bot. What this bot does is that it broadcasts newly categorized uh, um, uh, stops on the English Wikipedia, and it uses the wiki project identifier as a hashtag. Uh, as a result, uh, you can follow a hashtag uh, and presumably be able to identify articles that need some love, they need to be expanded. And without any publicity, I think at this stage, this is followed by three followers. It generated, uh, uh, so, and one is me, um, it <laughs> generated uh, um, over, over the first few days with no publicity, uh, more than 5,000 click-throughs. So, you know this effective driving some traffic, 
imagine this could be run at scale. This is a silly <coughs> of to put together in a couple of hours before uh, before the conference. That's seven followers. Seven followers? <laughs> <laughs> make it make it go up. Come on, follow. Um, and so um, these are really proof of concept ideas, but the, the question I'm interested in is really what would be the infrastructure needed to run these campaigns at scale? Um, the first one that we've been discussing internally, but I'd like to see if there are use cases coming from the community, is this idea of a task API, right? So uh, imagine if we had the ability of retrieving a set of articles in need of uh, help uh, by selecting arbitrary criteria. So imagine if we could turn all these kind of templates into a service that we could query and say, hey, give me all articles in a given field, like chemistry. Um, but actually, only give me articles in that field and near me by their geo-coordinates. And in fact, I want to filter, say, Canadian jazz artists near my city, but only for specific type of issues. Like, for example, um, those articles that need a, uh, a photo or that need citations that are not neutral. Um, and help me prioritize them by some criteria, like uh, the number of visits they receive, the number of incoming links. Um, so having a task API is a precondition that we will need to be able to generate these feeds and embeddable widgets uh, that we could experiment with to turn basically all of these static campaigns that we have uh, here and there into uh, leading call to action that we could host on third party sites, including um, uh, third party content publishers. Uh, second, um, a public media wiki event stream. So that, um, bot you saw before is really a dirty hack that was put together um, using this um, real-time feeds that you have heard about. So we have an IRC feed with all the revisions uh, that come from, uh, from Wikimedia projects. We have a new stream of events uh, that does the same thing um, using a different protocol. Uh, but we don't have a generic way uh, to broadcast uh, all events with the Wikimedia activity and to perform lookups. Um, so imagine, for example, if I wanted to know um, all edits that have happened across all Wikimedia projects that include a citation to uh, a DOI for the uh, um, scholarly, uh, the open scholarly folks uh, in the audience. Uh, I, I'd love uh, to, to have a, a way of tracking every time a scholarly paper uh, is added to Wikipedia and extract the DOI. And imagine the possible application we could have if we had a, a real stream of events uh, happening in real time you could just use to generate this um, um, this call to action. And the, the vision here is really to think of, uh, aside the uh, Twitter bots, I, I don't think Twitter bots are really the, uh, uh, the, the, the future of Wikipedia um, outreach, but think if we could apply this model to uh, an IFTTT-like uh, service where you could say, okay, every time there's a new edit of this type, we plug it into a service, and that service in turn does something. It alerts the appropriate people, it automatically generates some activity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and finally, uh, I think the third crucial part of infrastructure is campaign analytics. So few people may know that we already have in production built-in support for what we call sign-up campaigns. So right now, if you point someone to the uh, sign-up page uh, of any project, uh, I think, of, uh, uh, of Wikimedia, and you attach a, a campaign parameter, like campaign equals foo, um, that sign up, if successful, will be tagged with that campaign identifier. And the reason why this is super powerful is that uh, we can then look at all people who sign up with that identifier, treat them as a cohort, and generate some activity, uh, some activity metrics about that cohort, um, using a tool like uh, Wikimetrics to perform cohort level analysis. And so uh, if we have that, then, uh, implemented in a, in a um, uh, programmatic way, we could identify which campaigns uh, are driving, say, the most uh, active contributors, generating the best, uh, the best content, and so on and so forth. So there's a real opportunity here that could be, um, that could be leveraged by using almost off the shelf of functionality that we have uh, uh, at the foundation. So, and I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, I think we, we often see Wikipedia as this island that is not and uh, uh, should not maybe integrate it with the rest of the web. And we tend to think of outreach as something that uh, doesn't mean technology, you know, it's something that we do uh, when we get together with a bunch of people that want to run an editor. 
Um, I'm interested in how we can use campaign technology and analytics uh, to basically bridge the gap between Wikipedia and the rest of the web, specifically expert communities that exist out there. And so I think for this, we should look at these gaps and biases in Wikipedia and think of how we can generate uh, uh, potential hooks for participation. Um, we need bits of infrastructure that uh, could help generate these campaigns programmatically and not with the extra overheads that is needed to run something massive as a Wikileaks monument. Um, and we also need to have uh, um, yeah, analytics to measure their impact. Uh, and uh, I think that by building these targeted campaigns, we can reach a potential volume of contributors uh, before they even visit or before they even register on Wikipedia, which I think is going to be an opportunity that we haven't um, systematically explored uh, in the past. I have a, uh, an interpad here where I'd love to hear if you have use cases. I talk to the open scholarship people, but if you think that there might be something that could benefit from this approach, I'd really like to hear from you. Uh, and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. So the question is, uh, what is the overall strategy behind this? Uh, we see on the one hand some strategies related to acquisition of the users. In some other cases like this one, it sounds like more related to uh, attracting people who may uh, fill some gaps in the, in the content of, uh, of within the projects. So, and I think that the, uh, um, and there was also uh, a comment on the fact that uh, the, uh, um, the bot currently is really generic and it doesn't really cater to specific uh, audiences. So that last point, uh, uh, yes, you're totally right. Uh, it's a uh, it's a dirty hack. Uh, one day we might have uh, hundreds of, uh, of Twitter bots as a function of uh, all different uh, projects we have. Um, there's some benefits, I think, about the centralized uh, bot, but we can talk about this uh, offline. In terms of the general strategy, I think that, uh, uh, so there's this trade-off, uh, it's not really a trade-off, uh, it's basically uh, two different angles that uh, at least the Wikimedia Foundation we're currently considering. One is uh, uh, the population um, um, size problem and the retention problem that uh, you've seen before illustrated by, by the research that Aaron Singh was presenting, uh, we have uh, an urgent uh, and important problem about uh, the, the size of people who are there and who can engage in uh, contributing but also maintaining, discussing uh, a policy or, 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 or participating in, a, in discussion on talk pages. Um, so there's a definite need for uh, engaging new contributors and uh, making sure that we have a sustained uh, population behind our projects, right? And we haven't been able to substantially affect that decline in some of the largest projects we've seen. There's also a, com a complementary uh, angle. The complementary angle is really about coverage, right? You might say that, uh, you know, there's no need to expand Wikipedia, it's good as is, but something that I mentioned, for example, is a cross-language disparity. So the same kind of campaigns here could be used for getting people to translate uh, um, articles in languages that don't have the corresponding articles. So I think it is a massive and often underestimated issue about uh, um, coverage and uh, uh, how V is not complete and may need a new So I think really the two strategies are complementary and this is just a different angle. Yep. Yeah. I'm not keeping track of the order, so sorry if I skip anyone. Yes, it's public, and uh, there are at least two reports uh, that are contained on Wikipedia. Uh, there are two researchers, uh, um, one is uh, um, uh, Morton one, the other one is, uh, um, Aaron, help me, um, maintaining the uh, red link uh, ranks. Who's the, uh, the other, uh, other than Morton? 
Yeah. Um, anyways, thank yes. you. Um, so there are there are reports that are generated by bots uh, on Wikipedia itself, uh, where you can see on a weekly basis uh, what are the most uh, the most popular red links, what are the most uh, popular um, red links, both by um, uh, traffic but also by incoming links. So there are really these lists that are kind of hard to turn into APIs, uh, but they exist and they're maintained by absolutely extraordinary uh, community design tools like these bots. Yeah, so I think you're right. So, but you also answered your, your question that there's a, there's a competition for attention for these banners. Um, and I don't think we've found a good model. I'm not particularly involved uh, in this issue around central notice, how this is used. Uh, but I know that uh, one of the, uh, the big pain points is that uh, it's a space that is limited and it's being, uh, you know, uh, asked for by, by many different stakeholders. And um, so, um, yeah, that would be definitely so. Having triggers uh, on a on a site that can be used to invite users to uh, to do something constructive as a function of the topic, as a function of uh, the demographic where they come from, that would be really valuable. And in fact, I believe that uh, there are some projects uh, that uh, um, are trying to make these um, templates more actionable. So basically, turn these quality issues <coughs> into the print of your banners, but really um, uh, on a, on a practical basis. Uh, the focus of this, of this presentation is really on uh, what communities and content publishers could do that are not yet on our site. So again, it's kind of complementary to, to, this, to this problem. Yes? Uh, you have said that it's able to, we are able to track uh, incoming users uh, by adding the uh, URL parameter to the, to the sign up site, the sign up page. Yeah. Is it possible to do it uh, by adding That's right. So there's a, a two things. There's a new uh, campaign extension that I think Stephen has been um, redesigning, and uh, that includes the ability of doing something slightly better than this current hack that we have, including making these campaigns uh, sticky, I think, so that you can basically uh, point someone to the article as opposed to the sign up page. But there's a hack that you can use with, this, with the current system. They give specified the return to um, parameter to the article you're interested in. You can basically point people there, attach a campaign, and make sure they have to register the land on the page. It's a dirty hack, but it works. Yeah, but it discourage people from it. It will discourage people from uh, going directly to the article. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, totally. And I think that uh, there was just an example, and these were examples where uh, researchers were involved. So uh, people at CMU were, were heavily involved in the design of these campaigns and the analysis of this data. Uh, but there are many scholarly societies. So I think that scholarly societies, uh, GLAM uh, partners, uh, are all potential uh, stakeholders that could benefit from, from this project. But yeah, that, that one specific is a, 
was a good one because it was really trying to drive the extra contributor to a terrorist sense. Is that? Yeah, okay. Thanks, everybody. Many thanks to Eric, Stephen, Aaron, and Dario. We've now got about 20 minutes for a break, so we'll be back in here at half past. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>